Um, so, yep, we've got Jackie now. Hi, Jackie, how are you? Hey, I'm doing good, thank you. How are you? Yeah, I'm very well, thank you. That's a really nice background you've got. It's all right, isn't it? I just thought I'd bring that... a bit of Mountain Glorious to you, to you all. Yeah. With Zoom now, you never know if everyone's using a virtual background, if that's a real one, but this, I think that's yeah. a real one, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's genuine. Uh, this is awesome. Thanks so much for having me, Josh. It's amazing what you've put together, and um, I hope we can make raise well and beyond of the 10 grand over the next few days. Yeah, I, I think so as well. Um, so for anybody who doesn't know you, are you able to just quickly introduce yourself, um, what you'll be covering, and then we can just kick it off um, and get stuck straight in? Absolutely. So I'm actually going to, I've got some slides here, so I'm going to share these. Yeah. I've got the ability to, there we go. It's working, yep. Great, um, fab, so, um, so I'm Jackie Tomes um, and I run a, a, a business called Property Strategy uh, and also Tomes Homes. Uh, so Tomes Homes, we invest in blocks of flats uh, on the outskirts of Kent with investment partners and we do the buy, refurbish, refinance strategy uh, and we built that up since we started back in 2014. I bought the first property for £108,000 and uh, pre-corona with the portfolio was worth about £6 million. So it's been an epic kind of seven year journey to get to this point and from everything we've learned in doing building up Tomes Homes, uh, that's what property strategy has been built on and we're all about detail, structure and analysis, focus and clarity and that's what I'm looking to bring today through this session here. Wow amazing yeah we, we certainly everyone's going to take a lot away from this um, I'm really looking forward to this I'm going to be sitting in my notepad um, and really taking loads of notes what I'm going to do is I'm just going to turn mute my mic turn the video off um, so hopefully we get as strong as possible connection for the screen share um, and yeah let's get started. Great Fab, so let's, um, let's get straight into this. So the agenda that we're going to be covering, covering on this morning's session, uh, we are going to be looking at uh, predictions for the property market values and our prediction for what exactly the curve is going to be looking like. Uh, we're going to look at the factors affecting the property market and how we see those factors that are influencing market values, uh, how we see that evolving over the next 12 to 18 months. Uh, I'm going to talk about discounts. Um, so if we're looking at pre-market, uh, pre-corona market value, what sort of discounts do we need to get at various parts of the, uh, of the curve to, to de-risk? Uh, and then we're going to look forwards. Uh, principles to inform your 2020 strategy. What needs to evolve and change? And what key actions do you need to take to move yourself from just survival, because that's the first thing we've got to do, then we can adapt and then we can move into thriving. Uh, let's remember what this is all about. Um, it's amazing how many people are giving their time over the next few days and it's all about this. Uh, please donate now. If you haven't donated already, please do. If you've donated and you think you could do more, please do as well. That's the link uh, there. I'm sure Josh will be sharing that uh, in the groups and on the live stream as well. So uh, please just take a moment to give what you can for, uh, for a cause that really needs as much of our support as possible. Um, so this is us, this is Tones Homes. Um, our vision is about making renting better than owning. So our properties are offered uh, to the private rented sector. Um, and our vision is to make that whole experience through providing a high level service and through the great team that we've got to make it just superior to what else you would get on the rental um, market. Uh, and that vision is something that's evolved over the last seven years since uh, Tomes Homes was uh, just a crazy idea when I was sitting in that ski chalet over there. Um, so we're here in the French Alps at the moment. Uh, it was meant to be 10 wonderful weeks away skiing, but that hasn't really worked out uh, thanks to um, the, the pandemic that we're in. Um, but what we've been shifting, rather than being skiing for the last five weeks, France went into lockdown a week before the UK did. So what that's given us here is a real ability to be a little bit ahead of the curve. Um, we went into lockdown and so rather than hitting the slopes every day, we have been analysing risk assessing and seeing how we can uh, adapt and evolve and support our clients too through this time. Um, so I'm known as the property strategist because strategy is my thing. Uh, my background before property was market research, uh, so consumer insights. So I used to, I worked on both the qualitative and quantitative side um, and it's all about understanding human behaviour, what makes people tick. Um, and so we've got both myself and my husband Dave who I run the business with 
we're both hugely analytical and we come at things from very different perspectives and feeding that uh, research analysis and data into actionable decision making that is uh, probably one of the things that we're best at um, so I used to work for brands like these guys here it was a really cool and interesting job but the problem for me was uh, whilst it was a really good job I didn't like being told what to do about by other people which is what led me to set up Tomes Homes and, and ultimately uh, become an entrepreneur which I didn't really expect would be the case uh, and a uh, property strategy has been born out of all of that right so this is a bit of a blurry um, screenshot but you don't need to read the words this is from a Financial Times article uh, which is tracking some of the previous uh, recessions uh, in different parts of the world as well um, and this is the sort of thing that we've been kind of geeking out on um, not only over the last five weeks but also through uh, five years ago we started working with some uh, amazing business mentors and at that point we had no strategy no structure nothing uh, and if this pandemic had happened then we would have been in really poor shape but thanks to their guidance we uh, we spent some well, we sp like, spent some money invested some time in uh, in analyzing the previous uh, recessions that had come along we, we knew that a recession was going to come again uh, and we were like we want to know the trends and what happens so that we can be as prepared as possible for all of that um, so this is the sort of stuff that we uh, that we've been using to analyze and, and make some decisions um, So I think the most interesting one to show uh, this one here is the green line here Hopefully you can see my cursor on the screen there. That's the global financial crisis um, And what you can see there is that drop that this uh, the main drop that we had in the financial crisis here um, That that took I think it was about a year and a half to actually reach the bottom uh, there so this is going to start to feed into the curve um, alongside all the other factors for thinking how, how are things actually going to play out over the next 18 months. So what I'm going to do is this is um, a graph showing um, along the bottom Q1 2020 through to Q4 and then into 2021 Q1 Q2 and Q3 um, and all of this today is, is focusing on the market value of property what are property prices going to do so along the top here that the higher up the graph we are the higher property prices are and the lower uh, the further that they've dropped so this isn't this isn't zero down the bottom here uh, this is just a representation of the kind of shape and trends that we we predict the property market is going to take now this is based on our own uh, analysis and piecing together the puzzle which I'll show you in a minute uh, what I would say is uh, this is not the gospel truth um, you take from this what you feel makes sense to you what serves you feed in your own stuff too we're updating this all the time but what is going to be really helpful about all of this is that it gives you a narrative under which to make decisions and whether it's this or whether it's an adjusted version we have found this so helpful to make decisions because suddenly when everything just gets thrown up in the air uh, you can't make decisions on anything anymore and it just sends you into a swirling vortex of chaos and that is what we want to get rid of and that's what we're focusing on here today so i'm going to build up the picture of why we've come to this conclusion of this shape in what we feel is going to be happening with property uh, prices property values so let's go back to a world before corona uh, when we thought corona was just a nice refreshing drink uh, pretty much so q1 2020 uh, so over this other page here now we actually had a really good start to 2020 uh, the general election uh, the markets were nervous about a Corbyn led government coming into power uh, which didn't happen so that the markets reacted really positively to that uh, so the general election led 2020 to start really strong um, and also the fact that we actually moved to that next phase of Brexit, um, we're all totally fed up with that, um, we moved to that next phase. So what this meant was it looked like 2020 was going to be a really good year where uh, some pent up demand was unleashed, so we say. Um, then we start to um, we head into Q2 and actually to be fair I probably could have put this even before uh, Q2 but that low Bank of England base rate um, what we've got here, I'm going to be showing some different factors. If it's a green factor, this is a factor that is positively affecting the property property prices, as in they are staying where they are or even rising. Um, if it's a yellow um, shape, that is something that's kind of, we're not sure whether it's going to be negative or positive or what exactly that's going to mean. Um, and uh, then red is something that is, is having a negative or downward effect on property uh, prices. So the fact that we have a low Bank of England base rate and it's got even lower, that is overall positive uh, for property values because uh, you can borrow cheaply, which means people can go out there and buy uh, properties without a lot of uh, money, which is uh, without requiring a lot of cash and it doesn't cost them a lot. Uh, moving away from that, uh, 
a, a, a good factor coming into this whole corona situation is that property is not over leveraged compared to the last recession we've analyzed all the recessions uh, that we could and the more data we could get the better compared to previous recessions particularly 0809 uh, property is not over leveraged the regulations been brought in by the banking industry to mean that banks have to be far more stringent about the checks that they do um, and also a uh, separate point really that the banks have got to hold far more cash in reserve so in terms of like uh, banks and lending and the the chance of repossessions it's, we're in a lot better shape than we were in the last in the last recession another positive factor going into all of this is the government response uh, never has there been uh, through recessions, such huge government support uh, in, in literally handing out money as much as they can to the population. Uh, and that is, is going to have a positive uh, upward pressure on property uh, prices because uh, people are less likely to default on their, uh, their lending. More on that in a moment. Um, they, even if they would have lost their job, otherwise they haven't because the government have supported that supported through that so that's good news for rents a lot of rents being able to be paid at least in some form um, and also people not defaulting on their mortgages this is the next one is a really big one um, a positive factor banks have been compelled by the government to support mortgage holders and I actually think it's really clever the way it's been done because the uh, in the last recession the banks became enemy number one uh, and what the government are essentially doing is saying look hey this is law of reciprocity. We supported you last time, even though you'd really messed it up. Now you've now's your turn to repay the favour. So the bank's being compelled by government to support mortgage holders. They're giving mortgage holidays. Uh, the impact of that uh, to credit files we'll see, but definitely in the in the short term, it's, it's going to pre prevent mass repossessions because just because you're three months in arrears doesn't automatically mean you're going to be uh, pushed into repossession proceedings. Right, then we move into some of these negative factors. Now, the stock markets saw a massive drop um, over the last, uh, well, it was about, probably about three or four weeks ago now. Um, it has been, it's been bouncing around ever since. But when stock markets fall, uh, it's very quick feedback to the market. And a lot of what we're going to be talking about as we go forward is the human psychology behind all of this. Uh, and when stock markets fall, that freaks people out. Um, a lot of people will have lost money already on their investments. It doesn't put you in a place of feeling very confident. Uh, and that is an important factor. What we also saw as we went into this lockdown is obviously travel restrictions. And we're learning more and more that these travel restrictions, they're not just going to go away quickly. And whilst when I first made, uh, started making these predictions, I thought, you know, maybe we're in for a short, sharp shock. We'll lock down for a bit. We'll come back out of it. We'll bounce out. The way that things are moving is not looking like that at all. And those travel restrictions remaining in place is going to mean uh, it's not great for, for the economy in general. But also in terms of uh, if we're thinking about demand for property, overseas investors uh, are probably less likely to be coming over and buying property. So therefore, we're reducing uh, the available people who are looking to actually buy property, which is not good for prices. Um, also, to add to that point there, I'm not sure I've got it later, um, there's that recent tax change where there's an additional stamp duty surcharge for international investors. So that's, not also, that's also going to be reducing demand to come and buy UK property. Uh, growth and unemployment. Uh, unemployment has artificially been buoyed up by the government job retention scheme, but even beyond that, there you know people aren't getting their contracts renewed. Um, people didn't have uh, people are people's businesses are closing, and so obviously the furlough thing isn't there anymore. So that growth in unemployment is going to lead to less interest in buying property uh, because if you're in survival mode, your first thought is not to go and uh, move house to buy a new property. Uh, so that's going to put a that's a, the opposite to one of the green ones it's putting a dampener effect on on demand in the market here's when we've got lockdown come in um, and the moment i just put it at this red point here is really like q2 into q3 um, but that lockdown it's all of a sudden economic activity has just fallen off the cliff in a way that's never been seen before um, um, and I actually, I think maybe this line here, the way that I've got it in terms of the angle, I think it could even be steeper um, than that, just because it's so quick how, how fast everything changed and suddenly people aren't spending money anymore, they physically can't, which is having a really negative impact on the economy. And it's not just going to come bouncing back because it's having such a big impact on businesses, more on that later. 
Uh, of course, valuation challenges. We actually had a valuation booked in for two days after lockdown. One of my clients had a valuation booked literally the day after. Uh, valuations are not happening. Lenders are trying to adapt, obviously, to do um, AVM valuations, so their desktop valuations. But those valuation challenges are going to mean that well, banks are more cautious if they're doing desktop appraisals. They may well depress the, the values that they're taking or at the very least affect the loan to values. So those valuation challenges are going to lead to depressed values, not least because it means the cash buyers are in charge. And when the cash buyers are in charge, they're going to want lower prices. And that's going to lead to a downward pressure on property prices. Uh, reduced loan to values that is also going to impact how many people are actually able to go out there and buy property because suddenly those those like I think there's five ten percent products have pretty much disappeared from the market that's the busy sector anyway but buy to let the 85 80 percent they're gone and even some lenders are going down to like 65 percent so you need more cash to buy property right now which doesn't help uh, boost the demand uh, and all of this is leading to huge uncertainty uh, and uncertainty does not give people confidence and when people have, don't have confidence they don't do stuff they don't buy properties so that is leading to less demand in the marketplace too now interestingly the fact that we're all in lockdown at home is also meaning that maybe you were thinking about selling your property but maybe you're not anymore so you don't want people to come around to do viewings uh, you're just like we'll just we'll just sit tight where we are for now so that actually means there's less supply coming to the market so in a way that helps to balance things out to some degree this is probably the biggest one though a huge drops a, a huge drop in uh, property transactions uh, transactions because they just can't happen the government don't really want you to move so a huge drop in uh and the activity in the housing market will mean the only people who are selling are the motivated ones and when it's the motivated ones that are set being sold they're the ones that are probably accepting discounts, uh, which is then not going to help you to uh, help the property market prices to, to look higher. Because really what we're going to see and we haven't got it, uh, a true picture yet is once uh, in a, I think it's in a couple of weeks time that we should be able to see the market data that is always the past. Most recent one thing, but great, but hey, the property market data, we only get it. There's a line to get that data, unlike the stock market. So uh, that's going to mean that there is a, a larger uh, drop in, trend in, in the property values as things that are going through. I've got to some green, but the lack of plan, like at the moment, getting planning permission through for anything, pretty much not happening. Planning committees aren't sitting, uh, which ultimately is going to mean as we go in the months they are then able to be start being built, uh, which is going to mean that the properties, the, the land that does have planning permission, it's going to become more valuable. Uh, maybe it only levels out, uh, but that means there's an upward uh, land value pressure there. I don't want here. Oh, I've got a little message. Oh, oh I'm going to turn the video on. Stop video. Let me know if that connection is any better, Josh. I can try something different if not. So then the next phase uh, to cover is just, and I kind of mentioned this before, that uncertainty, but also the arrears that are being built up um, is meaning that there's less selling, less supply, which then has a bit of a, a calming effect based on all of these more uh, extreme factors. Great, thanks, Josh. Right, where are we going next? Now, this is really interesting. When we first went into this like, recession, we're not going to really start going into a recession until probably Q2. So then, because a recession is uh, two consecutive quarters of, uh, of contraction. So therefore, we thought Q2, Q3, uh, and then it will be at uh, the beginning of Q4 that it becomes common knowledge that we're in recession, even though we've already been there for two months and everyone freaks out. But actually, March has seen such a sharp decline. We've pretty much already started that process. So probably Q1 will actually see recession beginning. Q2 is the second quarter. So actually that common knowledge will come in Q3. Um, so I've put it in yellow here because when people don't really know we're in recession, they're calmer. Uh, but once we come out of uh, once it, the, the official data is there and the newspapers can have a field day uh, that's going to create some panic, which again is not going to uh, bring that confidence that we need for people to be active in, that, in the property market. Um, we're going to con continue to see stock market volatility as we go through the next three months, I think even beyond. So that's a negative factor too to people's confidence. 
And, and then as we continue through the year, yes, there's some great measure that the government's doing right now, but the problem is they're uh, essentially building up a load of extra debt for us. Um, you know, they're complaining landlords, the kind of, uh, rent payment deferments, mortgage payments are being deferred, you're allowed to defer your tax bill, uh, the VAT bill, you know, this, and this is us personally, but also as a country as well, we are accumulating a lot of debt uh, and that is going to have an overall negative impact to people uh, wanting properties uh, and just that drag that we'll see you know even if the lockdown did ease after say three months is we're still going to have this drag because of that interesting one brexit deadline looms i've got that so <laughs> Q end of 2020, maybe you might think, well, maybe things are starting to get back to some version of normal. Um, maybe things will start to pick up. Now, I think the difference here is Brexit. Uh, the Brexit deadline, the transition period, ends at the end of December. So where there may have been some confidence returning, everyone's going to get obsessed about Brexit again, uh, which isn't going to be good for confidence. People are going to be waiting and seeing, kind of like they were. Um, at the end of last year or even last year or the year before in general just that Brexit concern has put a lid on on a, on a lot of on the property market in general so Brexit deadline is looming um, so therefore that's continues to have a negative effect um, we then start to see the stock lockdown measures starting to release uh, depending on how that looks uh, that could be slightly more of a positive factor one thing that we've got all the way along the bottom here is that social distancing is going to continue in some form until there is a vaccine. Everything that I've read, we're looking at 12 to 18 months until we have a vaccine and actually hearing more about the fact that it's, it's mutating um, as, a, as a virus, you know, who knows how that's going to play out. And that social distancing is going to have an effect on the wider economy and on people's uh, confidence too. So that, um, that is going to have some impact as well. Uh, then we go as the year progresses how is that government support going to evolve and change because they can they keep throwing money at the situation like they are now probably not and some more uh, businesses are, are going to fail and what happens when the banks don't have to give payment holidays anymore how, how is that going to play out so I put that as a yellow because I don't quite know what way it's going to go what we may well see in the last quarter of this year as things are starting to get moving again is a, a a build up in latent demand now that's only a yellow at this point because i don't think it's going to be really strong and i think partly due to the brexit situation if brexit gets pushed back to next year i think we could be in for an even longer downward trajectory uh, i've put here increase in divorce rate now i stopped short of putting that in green because i just felt wrong but really what this and a divorce rate if we're just being really cold and hard about it means an increase in the number of households we're going to more divorces are going to happen because we're stuck at home love you dave uh, with our uh, partners and that uh, that's gonna in increase that chance that you realize that this you've had enough so increasing divorce rate could mean that coming out of this we have a an increase in the number of households uh, and that's probably households could be purchasing but could also be renting too uh, so that could have a potentially have a positive impact on uh, property values uh, potentially if we can get Brexit done at the end of this year I think that's a really positive thing no matter what really happens I think just having that certainty is what the market is really missing at this point um, what we are hypothesizing is that stock market confidence could start to return at the beginning of next year I don't necessarily in a big way but I think it's just going to be a gradual build as lockdown starts to release businesses start to get back to a new way of working and we start to have a bit more clarity on how the situation progresses but those businesses building momentum which is good but I don't think it's just going to be like turning back on the tap again you know you've you furloughed workers, you had plans that have changed, all the great momentum that you had forward. We found it in our own business. We had great plans for this year, great forward momentum, and all of a sudden everything just stops and you have to reassess. And then getting that new plan going again is going to take that build of energy like a, like a turning wheel does. Uh, potentially pent up demand being released at the beginning uh, or early parts of next year. Um, more certainty returning in terms of how things are working will lead to more demand. Uh, downward deferred taxes are due, personal taxes become due that they, the government let you push back, not good. Uh, and we think that actually all of these factors, and because there's always a bit of a lag to how things work, that the recession really is still going to be continuing in uh, to the beginning of next year. Um, but as these, uh, these green factors here start to build that momentum, we think that coming out of the recession, I'm going to slightly contradict myself in a moment but potentially uh, towards the middle to latter part of next year.
I've got baby boom here. Not only are we getting fed up with our partners, but we're also bored as well. So uh, looking at maybe some more babies coming along at the beginning part of next year. Um, and that baby boom ultimately means people's families are growing. Uh, and if they can possibly do so, they're going to want a bigger place for all their, uh, their growing uh, brood. That's the word, isn't it? <laughs> so again, an increase in demand for, for new houses and activity in the housing market. Uh, and then it got towards the end of 2021 uh, here, uh, potentially there's a vaccine. And then that it, once we've got that, and maybe things, maybe they'll never return to normal, but closer to normal on the back of having that, that's going to be a really good factor too. Now, uh, the only thing that's just changed is I've changed that. So if you look down the bottom of the slide there, um, I've just slightly changed the, the timeline, extended it. Now, I didn't have time to redo this whole slide, but the more and more that I hear about uh, particularly how the vaccine um, is, how important that is, and how much of an impact this is having on businesses, and businesses going into administration, uh, maybe even folding like completely, I, I just feel more and more that this could be an even longer curve. And so whilst I think, I'm not saying the vaccine is going to be moving back to Q1 2022, but maybe some of these other factors, everything just kind of stretches out. Um, so that is something that I'm, I'm going to be playing around more over the days that come, because I think potentially this could be a bit of a longer situation here. But hey, good news, around this time in 2020, the property conference raises over £10,000 for the NHS. That's right, guys. That's what we're doing right here, right now. So just a little reminder, please donate now. Josh, I'm sure you'll pop in the um, donation link in the, in the chat box or on the various pages. Uh, I hope you're enjoying this. This is um, all in aid of the NHS and supporting them. So please uh, donate again now. If you, this has given you any ideas or inspiration for how you're changing, how you're running a business, in return, I'd love you. Please donate to the NHS. Uh, thank you very much. So, whew, that's like a load of information there. What's in summary, what we're looking at? We're entering a recession. It's, it's already beginning. It's not official yet just because of how it's done, but we're entering a recession. And the, and the big problem for us, this is all about property at the end of the day, the lack of ability to assess market value right now means we need to be really careful about the discounts that we are getting on deals that we do. Uh, because we don't, this isn't the time to completely F up your property business. This is time to make sure you are de-risking and taking the advan advantage of the opportunity in the right way. Um, so banks reducing loan to values and surveyors down valuing. Um, this is overall a negative thing for the property market and it is going to have an impact on your deals. Um, if you've got deals that are exiting this year, what is the valuation situation going to be? So we need to be careful about how we how we play, particularly I would say the next nine months. Uh, and thanks for reducing loan to values, it could look like you have you know, more money being left in deals. What this will mean in the short term is that uh, I think yields are, are going to increase. Uh, property yields will increase because values are going to drop and that's what happens. But then, uh, because especially with buy to let, like it is the most solid uh, investment property investment at the moment um, compared to the alternatives. Uh, that's our main business model. And as more people choose or maybe adapt to doing that model more, there's going to be more supply, which will then have a downward pressure on rents, I hypothesize. So going back to this uh, general curve again, um, what the, the important part of all of this is actually timing. Timing is a really um, important thing for us to consider. If you are buying uh, at the market value or, or the value that you agreed three weeks ago, even if that was 20% below the market value at that point, that is not going to be 20% below the market value now. Uh, we don't really know how quickly the market's dropped. We'll find out uh, when the next round of data comes out. Um, but what this means is we are heading down towards the bottom of how far the property market has fallen. And I think I uh, read that... Um, I've forgotten the name, uh, well, quite a big leading body in, in research. They thought five to 10% drop. That was a few weeks ago now. I, I don't see how it can be less than 15% on average across the country. Um, and from some of the conversations that we've had, potentially you know, North could be worse affected than some areas of the South, we shall see. But if we call it an average drop that we're looking at of probably 20%, let's, let's plan for that. That's how far down we've got to go. Um, now, that, 
this is not to say that the bottom is definitely going to happen here, but this is our prediction about when it could be. Um, so then we've got a basically nine months uh, downward trajectory towards that and probably a very steep initial drop. And then maybe I think it will flatten out more um, as economic activity starts to find some way to, to return to some sense of normality. So if we were to say that this first part of the curve here will see a 12% drop, um, what we then looking at, uh, you've still got a further 8% to go. Um, so that's the, the bottom point there that we're looking at. Um, and so then each month, what you are potentially looking at is a 4% drop per month. That is really flatlined, and I don't think it's going to be as uh, linear as that. But let's, let's kind of work on that basis. So the point of all of this is to say that if you buy at whatever the market value is at this point here, in terms of refinancing, because that is a play that most of us are using in some way in property, if you buy at the market value here and your model is some kind of buy something refinance, then you're gonna need to wait until we're at a similar place in the market um, for over here. So the, the less aggressive you are with the discounts and the more you pay for the properties, the longer you are gonna have to wait to be coming out the other side again. And I think it's just a really good representation to, to have in your mind is if you're buying here, you, in terms of timeline, you, you're, you're gonna have to be waiting to refinance in here. Um, so that is like, what are we looking at, like 18 months? Now maybe your normally financing time frame is six months. So if that's something that you're wanting to be sticking to or trying to, you're gonna to have to have a bigger discount than just four or 8% here. You'll need to be aiming more towards the 20%, if that's the hypothesis that we're saying, um, in order to mean that you can refinance sooner. Uh, one of the really tricky things in property that we have to uh, contend with is the lag. Um, so the first property that, um, that we ever purchased, we purchased in the last recession, this was our home. Uh, we, uh, we actually completed on it in April 20, uh, 20 sorry, 2008, God, stuck in the 20s, uh, in April 2000, sorry, April 2009. We agreed to buy that property at the end of 2008. Now, April 2009 was officially the bottom of the market. But really, because transactions take time to go through, the actual bottom of the market was really three months before when people were making offers. So there's this weird time frame dichotomy that we have to, to wrestle with uh, in order to make sure we are <laughs> kind of timing the bottom without actually really knowing when that is. And so having that hypothesis about how far you feel it's gonna go and planning ahead and also being patient is a really important factor to, to doing the right kind of deals. And we have to be more professional now than we've ever been before. Um, because th th this is not the time to just put your finger in the air and think it's great. This is the time for research, data, analysis, and then action taking. More on that later. So here we go. Some broad principles to inform your new, shiny, wonderful 2020 strategy. Let's try and be positive about this. So the first one is that uh, 2020 is going to be a tough year for refinancing. Uh, review what plans you have uh, in place for 2020. We had um, a handful of refinances planned for later this year. Um, we, we're not, that, that, that's all under review essentially. Um, we don't think the year, this is going to be the year for releasing equity from properties. Um, and so, you know, it might just be having a delay of uh, six months might make the difference to, to getting back on track. But I would plan for this year being very tough because not only are valuations going to be hit, but loan to values are also hit. So kind of like a double whammy of, of cash getting stuck into deals. So it's going to be hard in the next six to nine months to do short term capital plays because we do not know when that bottom of the market will be. So if your model is normally flipping where you buy something quickly, turn it around and get it back on the market again within uh, six months, that's, that, you're probably going to want to rethink that because how, how confident can you, well, it's very hard to be confident at all on what the, the values are going to be. Uh, towards the latter part of this year. So that is a high risk strategy. Um, and uncertainty about knowing how long lockdown will be. We're all in the same boat. But what I would just be really careful about is hope. Hope is not a strategy. Um, I would plan for this lasting longer than you want it to and make new plans accordingly. Don't just hope that it's all going to be fine and that things will come back. That's if you can take some action now and adjust things, you don't need to rely on hope. And that's going to be painful. I'm not saying that it's not. We've made some really painful decisions over the last few weeks, but that is, that's life, that's business. So there's going to be difficulties exiting uh, in the way that you normally would as we go through 2020. So we need to adjust, particularly that time frame, uh, 
side of things. And I would, I personally would put a huge caution on high interest finance. So let's say finance, not finances. If you're going to buy something on bridging finance and your plan is to quickly turn something around or, you know, maybe even six to 12 months, how much confidence do you have to get off that bridge? Um, yeah, that is a very stressful situation to be in. So just be careful on that high interest finance and how exactly you set that up. If indeed you do, can you pivot how exactly you're financing your deals to mean that you're not exposed in that way? And here's the kicker. The deals have got to be better. Or maybe you're great at deals anyway. They need to continue to be as great as they normally are. Um, so we need to accommodate the fact that there's a, a highly increased chance of values dropping um, and so therefore it is riskier. Uh, and this one is from my lovely husband, Dave, Detail Dave. Uh, he's the spreadsheet guy. He's the patient one. I'm the impatient one. But there it is patience can be a virtue. Be, just really consider your timing on your next, next acquisition very carefully. Uh, because I know we all think, oh, well, the, you know, when everyone's scared, you do the opposite. Yeah, but you, you do the opposite, uh, but do it with a plan uh, and do it having thought through where things are going. Uh, because if you can time this right, 2020 could be a great year for you. If you're impatient and you just forge your head like a bull in a china shop, it could be a really bad year for you. Uh, and so with some of this extra time and this patience that we're going to be exercising, uh, now is a really great time to work on strategy and systemization. And I'll uh, share more some ideas about that as we go through. Um, but one great one that I, I wanted to share with you all today is that this is something that you can, uh, that we have created. It's called the Scalability Score Assessment Tool. Uh, it's completely free. Um, and this is a, an online assessment that you take. It takes about 10, 15 minutes. It asks you 30 questions about your property business and it will give you a score across the five five key areas of strategy, sourcing and acquisition, funding, delivery, financial management and team, as well as an overall percentage uh, score. And this is how scalable you are. So how good are you, how good is your infrastructure, your team, your systems, your processes? Uh, so we've created this to really raise the profile of what great strategy is. Uh, so this is something that you can go and do today. And I recommend you do it today because I would like to do something uh, different today, which is that whilst this is a free tool to do, for everyone who goes on and completes this today, uh, and that will support your own business, I will donate five pounds for every assessment that is completed today. So this means you get to do two things. You get to support your own business and you get to support the NHS without actually having to pay that either. So everyone go and make me donate loads of money to the NHS. Um, so that is, uh, Josh, if you're able to, to share that link in the chat, that'd be awesome. Um, so yeah, please go on, find a way that you, uh, it's a, it's a, you'll get a 60 page report, it's completely bespoke to, to your level uh, and then you've got something that's really tangible, broken down action steps that you can take to improve your strategy, to improve your systems through this time um, and then I'll tally it all up tomorrow morning and I will uh, make a donation for how many people have also improved their businesses which will be awesome. Right. Let's go into the business evolution blueprint. So this is about adjusting your business model. Um, so given some principles about how the market's going to go, so what do you do in response to that? So there are four key areas um, to help you adjust that, how you're operating, how you pivot. So first one is time frame, which I've alluded to quite a bit already. Then how do you adjust your business model accordingly? What finance are you using and how can that change to make it less risky and what's the sort of condition of the properties that you're working with so time frame can you amend the refinance time frame so maybe you normally uh, buy refurbish refinance within say six to nine months obviously six to nine months would be a great time to refinance could you adjust your deal to mean so that you're refinancing in 18 months or two years or maybe even longer could you adjust the uh, the approach that you've got also time frame to purchase. Uh, so maybe you've already got some deals in the pipeline that you've agreed at pre, uh, I call it PC, <laughs> pre-corona prices. So then maybe they, the vendor's happy to wait, um, but, but they want that price. Um, so you could do something more creative where you've got some kind of option or a lease option, uh, but just getting the timing right on when you actually complete on that on the basis of when market value is gonna be back in your favor. And also the timing of renegotiation. I'm sure like we do, you're, you have deals in the pipeline that you're trying to buy that you've agreed at market value a three, four, five weeks ago. How uh, the problem is going back to the timing and the lag that we have with data vendors who are selling their properties 
will believe that their properties are still worth what they were then. So if you go back and unless they're really motivated and try and re renegotiate too soon, you probably find that you don't get a great response. So timing that renegotiation to be in line with how people's mindsets evolve. Um, then you've also got the end, uh, so business model, some considerations here. Who is your end user? Who, if you're a, a large portfolio landlord, who are your tenants? Um, maybe before, maybe usually you have a uh, professional tenants, but maybe professional tenants are not finding it as easy to pay their rent as they used to before. Could you uh, adapt how you, uh, who you serve um, and uh, uh, diversify the sort of customers that you have in the portfolio? Uh, from the risk analysis that we've done, uh, about approximately 50% of our rent across the portfolio is in some way backed by the government, so it's benefits in some way or another, uh, which has actually given us a really nice blend of different types of income, uh, which has made it more robust. Purchase type. Um, so yeah, exactly how are you doing it? Could you be more creative? Uh, could you do assisted sales over a longer period of time or even assisted sales within this time frame uh, could mean that you can get a better, uh, you can make a deal work where it wouldn't before. Maybe a joint venture with the, um, like with the landowner, for example. How exactly are you purchasing it? And could you be more creative in that approach to make something work where it didn't before? Um, I think if rent to rent could be a really interesting opportunity for those landlords who haven't got a great arrears management process. Um, if you can, even if it's quite a lot lower than market value, give that guaranteed rent, that's going to really help. Um, and also, of course, the purchase price. So what percentage discount do you need to get on the uh, pre-corona levels to actually be comfortable? Um, so being really clear on that. Finance. Uh, what type of finance are you using? I've alluded to bridging finance. Is Could you pivot the exact finance that you're using? So one of the deals that we've got at the moment, we were planning to do, it's a block of five flats, we were planning to do a buy, refurbish, refinance approach on it uh, and get out within five to six months. Uh, so we're doing buying it on a bridge and refinancing to a term product. What, um, what we are looking at is because it's you know, it's not in our normal standard of condition of property, but it's perfectly livable and perfectly safe. So uh, what we are considering at the moment is proceeding with it in its present condition, um, not getting it with vacant possession. It means you've got a cash flowing asset from day one. Um, it also means that you can purchase with term finance from day one, which means that it really de-risks. Because for me, if I'm stuck on a bridge paying 12% and I've got no, no clear exit, that is, um, that's pretty like no-go territory. But if I'm on a term product and we've got our investment partners, we've all agreed on what the plan is and what the exit's going to be, maybe in say two, two years, maybe even 18 months would be enough. Um, looking at your interest rates as well. So we had some deals lined up again. When you get in and out quickly, you can pay high interest finance. But if you're in for a longer period of time, that's really hard or much harder to do. So maybe you could renegotiate with your investors, uh, potentially looking at lower interest, interest rates, but over an extended period of time. And that's going to be in return for doing a lower risk deal. So you know, looking at some of the other investment opportunities at the moment, if you can provide maybe cash flow along the way, that could be a great proposition. Um, and capital requirements. This is an interesting one to like play around with too. Perhaps you need to factor in uh, additional cash required to do a deal so that you've got some cash buffer there to support that deal. Um, just because the, the likelihood of arrears is so much greater than normal. And then finally, condition. Maybe you were planning, one of my clients is planning to do uh, a flip. So it was buy it, do it up, sell it on. But actually, same kind of situation as the one I just described. It's, it's livable condition. So instead, could you do a, uh, just rent it straight away and plan to do a refurb in the future? So it's more like a, uh, a, a short hold um, where you rent it out for a short period of time. Uh, when that tenant moves on, you refurbish the property uh, and then you sell it on. Uh, could you could you flip the, around that? So just changing, uh, moving from major works to more light refurbs, particularly with the challenges that we have during this time of, of contractors being on site. So could you play around with what condition the properties uh, that you offer are so that you can continue to operate in a lower risk way through this time? So some additional considerations for your 2020 strategy. How are we doing? Good. Um, open your mindset to different timeframes. I think I've made that one very clear. 
that you really focus on cash flow in the short term. I don't think it necessarily needs to be the highest cash flowing assets. Like in a way, HMOs are higher risk because of being able to uh, voids once they're there, they're harder to fill. So even if it's um, a lower, you know, even if it's buy to let rather than HMO, if you can get it cash flowing and you can sort out your arrears management process, that could be a really good um, way to move forward. Factor in that ca cash buffer more than you normally would to cover arrears and to cover longer voids. And adjust your assessment methods for the risk of different uh, types of tenants. Um, because you, you don't, if you're going to buy a property uh, that's already got a tenant in situ, we want to just avoid creating a liability from day one. And that could just be even how you set up your relationship with that person from day one and just how you manage that moving forwards. So factor in, you've got to factor in an estimated drop in values over the next nine to 12 months. Um, that's, that's really, really important. So what I'm going to go through now is quickly across survive, adapt, and thrive some key actions that you can take in your property business to move forward through 2020 uh, and to, to really start to inform your 2020 strategy. So kicking off with survive. Survive is about ensuring that your business comes out the other side of this. Uh, that is the priority number one. Until you've done that, you can't get to the other two points. So uh, risk assess your customers. Uh, this is something that we did um, four, four or five weeks ago now. Uh, we looked at all the tenants that we have across our portfolio and uh, found out, or if we already knew, uh, collated the list of different professions of those that rent from us, um, what percentage of their rents are supported by benefits, and got that all into a, a spreadsheet so that we could see overall what percentage of our overall rent roll we felt was at risk. Uh, and from that analysis, we, um, and when I say at risk, I mean at risk of deferment, because uh, this is, everything's a deferment. Uh, it's going to have a very interesting effect on the economy. I think uh, I've, I've been sitting on a committee that's been uh, advise, uh, building in some uh, advisory points uh, that's gone up to the government. And one of the things that I was really rallying for was stop calling it a holiday. This is not a holiday. This is a deferment. Um, so I think uh, just making sure that you've assessed that and seeing how much you feel is at risk of uh, deferment. Uh, so we reckon it's about 17 or 18 percent of ours um, we're obviously coming towards the end of the month beginning of the next month so we'll see how true our hypotheses are but when you've got that risk assessment and you've got that figure for what percentage you feel is at risk you can make decisions around it uh, and that's what we've done we've gone back to uh, we've, we've pushed back and amended our cash flow forecasts more than a minute risk assess your deals the deals um that you had pre that you agreed pre-corona and now um, what what did things look like for that deal there? What were the risks that you had on that deal pre-corona and what do they look like now? Um, so for example, the risk of downvaluing is probably way higher than it was before. But I think this is good to get perspective too, because I think because it is so present in all of our minds that we're in a bad time, we just kind of assume that everything is awful, but it's not. And I think if you can look at your deal and maybe you had a risk assessment that you did before coronavirus, uh, or if you didn't go and do one, think back and then say, what has changed about that risk assessment from before coronavirus to now? And it will just give some perspective because those risks were all still there. It's just the likelihood of those risks um, coming to fruition is, um, is much higher than before. Decision to not take action can also be an action. Now, just not taking action because you're burying your head in your sand, that is not me giving you permission to do that, no. Uh, this is to say, if you go and risk assess everything, um, you do the work off the back of this call, and you decide that actually the best thing for your business right now is just to wait. That is an action. Don't feel like you have to be doing things just to make you feel good, that, that's pointless. And so decide how you want to play it. And if that means you're just saying, you know what, for the next month, two months, I'm just going to watch this out and choose my timing carefully. That can be an action too. Uh, and this one through, through my wonderful uh, detail, Dave and, and Bernard, who's our financial con uh, controller, uh, ensure you have a quality cash flow forecast. 
Now, those of you who are more experienced in this call, you probably have a cash flow forecast already, which is great. Now's the time to look at how you can actually improve that. And that's a really good time to do that. If I'm talking cash flow forecast and you've not Scooby what I'm talking about, now is the time to learn because we need to be able to look ahead for your business. What is happening over the next nine to 12 months um, it, from a financial point of view? And how is that impacting your bank balance? We need to know. Uh, mentioned it many times already, improve your arrears management process. What happens when someone can't pay their rent? What, what's the process? How do you manage that? What's your communication with, uh, with your, your tenants or customers, whoever they are? Uh, improve your arrears management process to ensure that coming out the other side of this, and it may take time, it could take, could take a couple of years to, to bring the deferment back up to date, but if you've got a good process, it need not be lost revenue, it, it can be a deferment, it should be. Number six, build your cash reserves. Uh, this is something that our business mentors told us back in 2015, and we have focused so hard on it ever since then, and it is really hard to do in property because we see like a hundred grand in the bank and we go, could put that into a property deal. <laughs> so it's really hard to keep cash in the bank. Um, if you have got cash in the bank, great, well done. Um, make sure you are holding on to as much of that as you can, particularly through this really uncertain period. Um, and we've bolstered our cash reserves by uh, just drawing down on some interest free credit cards. Um, I don't think we're going to need it, but I just wanted to grab it while it was there because who knows how that finance area will change. So we just grabbed it, uh, you know, paid, paid a couple of percent in a fee to do it, shoved it all in the bank account, and it's like an insurance policy. So um, that, that, that's helped us to further bolster our cash reserves, which is, gives, gives comfort and helps to sleep at night. But you can also do that by cutting down your expenditure, which I think might be on my next one. Um, but how can you um, uh, spend less now to build up that pot, even if it might seem so small and inconsequential, every little helps. Um, so build those cash reserves as best you can. And number seven is get communicating with all your stakeholders to reassure them and to gain insight. So by stakeholders, that is your team, that is your tenants, your investors, uh, it could be your guests, you may have some long-term guests staying with you, um, your landlords, whoever it may be, pick up the phone and get talking to everyone. Just check in, like, I think just being a lovely human at this point and just making sure people are okay counts for such a lot. So get communicating, but also use that to find out how, how they're doing and, and use that to build into your risk assessment because, yeah, maybe it's not the answer that you want to hear, maybe things are worse, but at least if you know, you can actually do something and plan for it. How are we doing for time? Oh, doing pretty well. Okay, uh, adapt. Four key actions here. Uh, accept this isn't going to be quick and adapt now. Don't just don't, don't mull on this. Just uh, do some assessment, do some thinking, and make some changes now. Uh, pivot. Uh, renegotiate your current deals. Don't be shy about this. The world has changed, um, and you just being polite and carrying on with the deal at the current price is not going to be good for the long term health of your business. So, uh, time it right, but you're going to need to to renegotiate those deals to ensure that you're not overexposed. Uh, here we go that was it streamline your overheads so what can you cut back on this is from a business point of view and a personal point of view how can you cut back um what can you push forward so maybe there's some non-essential stuff you're planning to spend that you don't need to just really be ruthless uh, streamline how much money is going out and this can actually feed into the thrive part two more on that in a second uh, number four is adapt your investor avatar um the the way you're doing your deals, the way you're shifting your business model may well mean that the sort of investors that you normally work with are, are not so keen. Um, you may need to have a slightly different type of investor who would be interested or the sort of investor who's interested to carry on buying deals in 2020 when others may not. Um, so if you can adapt what exact person is going to be the right sort of fit, then you can really focus your attention on building up that pipeline of funds to be ready to go and the timing's right. So there's plenty of stuff you can be doing, just you don't have to be doing deals to be getting ready to do way more deals when the timing is right. And, and I hope that this session here has given you loads of thoughts and ideas about building your own risk assessment strategy and how you can adapt and communicate that. Share that with the, with your, with the wider world, share that with your investors because someone who's just like, yeah, I feel I might go and buy some deals at this point is not a great person to invest in, but someone who's thought it through, that has a plan, that's got a way to mitigate the biggest risks right now. Um, people still want to invest. Um, so and big inflation is, is coming down the line. Um, so just having your money in the bank at that point, not going to be a great uh, proposition. 
And then finally, we're going to thrive, five key areas. From all of this, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to like, I'm not doing the opposite. No, it's not about scaremongering, it's just about being uh, realistic and practical, assessing, analyzing, and then getting on with it, but at the right time. So do all of this, make a plan, uh, and then execute on it. Don't just sit on your hands. Um, that is how you can thrive. And if you can time the purchasing of the, your deals at the right point in 2020, this really could be the making of you. So keep that in mind, but remember patience. It's a real balance. I'm all about the balance. Uh, externally communicate the above, particularly to your deal source, not deal sourcer, because it might not be a source that you use, but where do you get your deal? your deals um keep keep in touch with them let them know where you're at let them know that you are you're not going to be sitting on your hands in 2020 you are going to be wanting to be buying stuff um but it's not going to be at the pre-corona prices but when uh when someone's ready to sell you're, you're here so communication uh and those streamlined overheads build on them and there are so many overheads that we take on that do we actually really need them? You know, everyone's working from home right now. Maybe you're paying out for an office that all your staff normally are in. How's it going? Could you actually not have that office at the other end? Uh, how much cash flow could that add to your property business if you can find a way to work remotely? So don't just come out the other side and go back to where you were before, but if you can keep that streamlined overheads, you could see your net profit incre increase dramatically. Um, so yes, turnover is a sexy number your total rent rolls a sexy number but who really cares it's the net effect of all of that um, so if you can streamline your overheads you could have far more from what you already have uh, keep building and strengthening those relationships so if you're reaching out to everyone now use that as the beginning of an of a new chapter where you do reach out more um, from your deal source your deal source to your investors uh, perhaps to your banks to your tenants to your team use this as an opportunity to 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 have a whole new chapter in terms of wider culture from your organization uh, if you're there for your team at this point they um they're going to really appreciate it um so build your culture through this time and focus on improving your systems and your infrastructure during this quiet time to be ready to scale up when the timing is right. So on that point, a few key ideas for what you can do. Uh, this is all bulked out in way more detail on the scalability score report if you wanna do that. Um, but here it is, systems and strategies, some key things that you can focus on, even if you can't leave your house. Your pipelines, your property and investor pipelines, your landlord pipelines, if you are a letting agent or you do rent to rent. Uh, how do you manage that process of someone being a potential opportunity all the way through to them actually being a client of yours? Uh, is it all on pieces of paper? Is it all in your head? Now's the time to get it out of your head and into some kind of process. Uh, if you're just starting out, an Excel spreadsheet is probably fine. And those of you who are more established on the call, you're going to want some sort of CRM system to, to manage all of that. So uh, you'll build your pipelines, figure out what those distinct stages are and how your opportunities move through it uh, so that you can ultimately get your team to support you more in the progression of potential opportunities. Uh, criteria, your deal and investor avatar this is going to change based on the work that you're doing to your business model your deal criteria will change so make sure that's you're really clear on that your deal sources are really clear on that and same with your investor avatar uh, review how what sort of investors you're working with uh, and make an action plan for what are going to be the right sorts of investors through 2020 and into 2021 uh, build those relationships i think i've covered that enough uh, number four lettings uh, we brought our lettings in house back in uh, the summer last year and we have seen our arrears drop, our voids reduce dramatically, uh, our rents have even increased where they were decreasing before and so what that has meant is the net effect for having our lettings in house is uh, our net profit has increased by like 50%. It's been huge. So if you have got a decent sized portfolio this could be something that you might be worth considering during this time. If you've got time to set up something new this could be worth considering. Your financial management systems, cash flow forecast, have you got a clear balance sheet? Uh, we've, uh, in, in our team, put a huge amount of focus and energy on it. We've got Bernard, who's amazing, who's set up an amazing dashboard for us. Uh, that's taken years of work, um, but it just started with a very simple cash flow forecast spreadsheet. So wherever you are, now's the time to improve those financial management systems because they are integral to surviving and ultimately thriving through these times and then wider operational infrastructure. 
How do you manage your tasks? How do you communicate with your team? Maybe it's a bit disparate. Can you streamline all of that, make it work better, more efficient, so that coming out the other side of this, you uh, have a business that is far more robust and ready to scale. Uh, so th here's a great way that you can find out more about what you can focus on and broken down into real nitty gritty chunks. Uh, and when you uh, complete that, we are, well, I, at the end of the day, for everyone who, who completes this assessment today, I will donate five pounds uh, to, uh, to the Virgin Money giving page. So let's get that up again. So here's what you, uh, actions you can take off the back of today. Please donate now if you haven't donated already. Uh, please go and donate to the property conference. There is the link. I'm sure Josh is sharing it as well in the comments. Um, this is, you know, yes, we're, we're in a very fortunate situation uh, working in property. I look at other businesses compared to ours, um, um, part of some incredible entrepreneur groups. And I look at their, the struggles that they're having compared to the struggles that our clients and our wider community are having. And we are in a very good situation. So let's use our good fortune to support those who are really going through the ringer right now and you can do that here uh, go to uh, uk.virginmoneygiving.com forward slash property con and donate uh, and you can uh, increase your donation without doing uh, without spending any more money by taking the scalability score assessment tool so that's you go to our website property-strategy.com forward slash the hyphen scalability hyphen score and do it today and I'll donate five pounds on your behalf to the NHS. So that's me pretty much done with the main part of delivery that I've got. I'm ready to take any questions that you may have. Um, so Josh, please do fire them over. Yeah, absolutely. First of all, thank you very much for that. An incredible presentation, so much value and really no detail spared on that. Um, you're very thorough and a lot of people have taken massive value from that. Um, let's just see where the questions are. So we've got a couple here. So we've got one basically. So if you're purchasing a property now, what, yep. what's the best thing to do? Um, is it kind of best to put out um, or re renegotiate the price? What would your recommendations be if you are currently in the process of purchasing a property? Uh, I would say my, my first reaction would be to, to look at how you can make it work still, but that's ultimately going to be a lower price in most cases or, or maybe if it's is the same price it needs to be a more creative approach like a like a lease option for example where you've got an option to buy for the next five years but at the current price um, so it might be an adjustment to your business model would mean that you could still make it work or it just might need to, mean, need to be that you drop the price um, and I think particularly with like projects that were planned to be refurbishments where you were having to buy on bridging finance if you could pivot that to be something where you could just rent it out from day one and you're probably gonna have a larger void at the beginning um just because of the challenges of getting things rented at the moment but if you can factor that into your figures um, and get it at the right price um and so for us we're looking at at least 15 percent drop on our current um uh, agreed prices to, to feel comfortable to proceed and then that's also if you remember the curve if it's 15 if we think it's ultimately going to be a 20 percent drop but we say we buy for 15 it's just going to mean that the timeline to being able to refinance is just going to be further down the track so it might, it might just by extending your time frame might make something work uh, where it otherwise wouldn't so yeah take that um that the business evolution blueprint look at the deal look at the um the, the exact business model look at the timeline the way you're financing it and the condition and just see what you can pivot as part of that deal and, and see there are probably a few options see what could work yeah yeah absolutely yeah fantastic um so another question say will there be a greater divide between the kind of the have-nots and have-nots will there be kind of more bias against the landlords um, and property investors and do you think this is going to lead to any kind of government intervention kind of as you go into recession again and maybe people start hating on landlords can you see any of that taking place i think it can't really get much worse can it like, we're <laughs> getting i think Richard brunson's taken a lot of flack and a lot of attention away from us at the moment um, no i actually think it, it could almost go the other way um because i think I think the majority of landlords, and maybe we, this is something we need to be finding a way to communicate. So most of the landlords that I know are doing their level best to support their tenants through this time. Um, so I think, I no, I, I don't. I don't think it's going to get any worse for landlords than it than it already is. And to be honest with you, we 
just by the nature of how things are set up we just have to be more flexible in our in our approach because we don't you know it's it, it's harder to go down the route of pursuing someone for debts than if you're a bank um so no i i think i think we're going to be all right and i think ultimately i reckon my money's on the i think section 24 might be delayed uh, because we need there's going to need to be support to ensure that landlords um actually continue to to rent their properties to the people who are in uh, in arrears with them but i also reckon that uh the three percent surcharge i reckon that will be lifted for a period of time because they're actually going to need us to keep the housing market from tanking in a way that ultimately affects residential um owner occupiers so no i think i think we're all right i think it's not going to get any worse than it already is <laughs> <laughs> yeah so uh, yeah at least we've got that to look forward to and i agree on there uh, i think there's already talks of a stamp duty holiday um just to try and get the market moving again uh, off the back of this um so um are the rent to rent models and service accommodation are still viable um i suppose even referring back to the kind of graph um from earlier on um it's kind of downward slope for the next couple of quarters how service accommodation going to fare throughout this do you think yeah i think service accommodation is probably well that and hmos um like by service accommodation is potentially a bit worse you just really need to the, the ones who've really pivoted and built built relationships with people like key workers for example um they they will do well one interesting thing is i think when we are unleashed from our lockdown we're going to want to go we want to get out of our house and we're probably not going to really want to go overseas or maybe even be able to go overseas so therefore uk holidays will probably increase plus they're cheaper and everyone's um, tight for cash so actually if you're in an area where you could appeal more to holiday makers um that 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 could be an interesting um, adjustment to more of a focus there um but yeah i think uh, factoring in if you're going to do further service accommodation deals at this point it's more important than ever that they also work as a single let as a backup um and maybe yeah. you could do risk it by if you're doing rent to rent with service accommodation you're doing rather than the guaranteed rent approach a joint venture with the landlord is, may well be better or doing on a management fee may well be better but yeah i think i would if i was doing service accommodation i would be i'd be cautious about taking on new units and actually that's kind of what i'm thinking about when i'm saying don't just hope it's going to be quick to go um it, it, maybe it is worth just covering your costs for the service accommodations if you if your insurance and if your bank allows you to do so pivot and just put a long term or longer term person in there who just covers the costs that might be worth considering yeah uh, absolutely i think that for a service creation at the moment if you're breaking even then you know you're doing better than the vast majority of people in that sector at the moment um absolutely. so another question so is now a good time to sell um, just to kind of be ahead of the curve in terms of the price fall that's going to happen? I reckon we might have missed the boat already on that. Unless you can sell very quickly. Um, yeah. I think I think you may have missed. Well, it depends. I think I probably would want to be quite motivated to sell something at this point. Um, maybe if you were able to sell something in the next two to four weeks, that that you might not be hit too badly. But I think beyond them, I would be trying to, I'd be trying to hold on in as long as your cash you can make it you know not be a liability in the short term and you've got enough cash reserves so yeah kind of quite dependent on the situation yeah ab absolutely i suppose even if you just kind of sell that quick um unless you've got a really really good property there's gonna have to be some kind of um implicit discount into that unit so really if you if you don't have to sell now it's probably best not to I reckon so. Okay, any other questions? Um, so you mentioned CRMs. Um, are there any you use? And what would you recommend um, for other people? So we, up until very recently, used Less Annoying CRM. Ridiculous name. But it's re I, I really like the, um, it's really simple. Like if you're not used to using CRMs and it's really, it's not, it's like seven pounds a month or something. So it's not, um, it's not a lot of money. Um, so that, that's something that we've used. We actually use Asana as our task management system, and we've started use turning because you can do project boards on Asana. Um, yep. So we use that now as our pipeline functionality because we've got the um, we've got premium Asana. So I was like, right, I'm not paying for less annoying CRM anymore. <laughs> um, and then for our for our training company, we use Infusionsoft, but that's quite a more expensive um, uh, system. Um, but yeah, if you're if you're brand new to CRMs and you're not sure where to start, I think Lesson on CRMs is a great place to start. 
no, it's perfect. Yeah, that's really helpful. Um, so in terms of kind of what strategies or what your main focus is at the moment, uh, what are you going to be doing over the next kind of three to six months um, to try and kind of capitalise on, on the falling prices best? So we will be, well, from a risk management point of view, I, we don't want to be buying anything on bridging finance. So we're going to be adjusting how, how and what we buy to be on a term finance from the very beginning. Um, and what that may mean that we can't do, you know, we're not doing refurbishments at the beginning. So that, yeah, so focusing more on the buy something that is pretty much cash flowing straight away manage it well in the short term and then when the timing is right move to just refer because we buy blocks of flats so we'll just refurbish the individual units um, as we go through um, so i think we have got a few deals that we're buying at the moment it's just about getting the timing on renegotiating those right and it's, it's still not time for that yet i've had a little note to look at that again at the end of this week and i thought it's not time yet i reckon maybe another four weeks um, until we start to look at going back and renegotiating those um, but, but it will be just a case of us keeping really a really close eye as keeping us plugged into as much data as we can to decide when exactly we um we strike so yeah refurbishments pushed back where possible uh term finance rather than bridging finance cash flow as, as the focus okay yeah amazing um so in terms of kind of the kind of commercial space what do you see happening with commercial properties do you think we're going to Kind of lose a lot of the offices as people start working from home and then that gets converted to residential um what, what's your kind of thoughts about that it's really interesting with offices i think i think people are going to have missed that uh, that if you're used to operating in an office it's such a big shift to just moving completely away from that so i think maybe there will be some but i think perhaps not as much as we're all imagining like zoom is great but you know it's nothing just being in the room with other colleagues as part during the week might change maybe it's that offices are occupied for less of the time or maybe it's more office shares go on um so yeah i think there could be an opportunity for some conversions to residential where landlords or businesses well for one maybe they've gone out of, of business so they don't need the offices anymore um or they realize they can they can work fine without them so yeah i think there could be an opportunity for that but i think yeah the high street i'm very interested to see what what gets adjusted um, there based on that, that it's, you know, it's really just accelerating the decline of the high street in a, in a way that we could we all kind of knew was coming, but it's just come a lot quicker. So I think it's going to be interesting to see how that adjusts after, uh, after the lockdown starts to release. Yeah, absolutely. I think especially with that, that's a lot of the high street, it's just going to really focus on them having an online presence. Really, I think Primark, you know, they've made, they were doing kind of 650 million a month, I think they said. Yeah. Um, and now, that, now they've got nothing just because they've not got a website, whereas Amazon aren't faring as badly. So maybe a lot of people might look to diversify away, have smaller shops and a greater online presence, which is going to free up a lot of commercial space for different uses. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, right, perfect. So we're almost up. Um, what we'll do now is we've got quite a few people that have done the scalability scorecard assessment. Um, I really just urge everyone else to do that. We've got close to 300 people on this. So even if, if, you, if you can't donate, if everybody does this, that'll be close to 1,500 pound the NHS. Um, so everybody go to property-strategy.com forward slash the dash scalability dash score. Um, the link's there, the link's on the screen. I'll post it on YouTube. Um, everyone just complete that. Even if you can't donate, just complete that. And then that's, that's in lieu of a donation. But ideally do both. Um, um, perfect. I think we're happy to wrap that up now um, awesome. and get Ashley and Emmanuel on. Uh, thank you very much for that. That was really thorough, um, really useful. Everyone enjoyed that. It was, it was really great. Thank you so much for having me. Good luck with the rest of the weekend. It's awesome. Thanks, Josh. Well done. Perfect. See ya. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.